Hello, and welcome to another episode of Health Affairs This Week, the podcast where health affairs editors go beyond the headlines to explore health policy in depth. I'm Kathleen Haddad. And I'm Michael Gerber. June is Pride Month, and we devote today's episode to health equity issues impacting the LGBTQ community. Michael, a lot is happening to advance health equity for sexual minorities, and at the same time, a lot is happening globally and domestically to stop the movement. Last week, Uganda joined Nigeria in passing a law calling for life imprisonment for anyone convicted of homosexuality. Aggravated homosexuality results in the death penalty. The health and safety of sexual minorities remains threatened in a host of authoritarian countries, including Russia. But we also have problems right here in the U.S. Michael, you've been looking into restrictions on health equity at the state level. What have you found out? Well, Kathleen, sadly, there's too much to talk about on just one podcast. But uh, the latest news on this front is probably that just this week, a federal judge slammed a new Florida law that had banned, um, quote, puberty blockers for minors, saying that uh, the judge said that gender identity is real and therefore patients and in the case of minors, also their parents and their physicians should be able to make decisions about appropriate care. Um it was just an injunction, uh, basically pausing the enforcement of the law just for the three uh, minors involved in the lawsuit. Uh, but he also indicated that he thought the law would likely eventually be found unconstitutional. Um, according to the AP, Florida is just one of 19 states with laws restricting or banning treatment for transgender minors, many of which haven't gone fully into effect yet. Um, They also say about 11 states plus the District of Columbia have passed laws explicitly protecting gender-affirming care. Uh, As I said, the judge's ruling is just a temporary injunction, and the state of Florida has actually already come out and said that they will continue to enforce the law, just not against the three individuals currently involved in the lawsuit. It's not clear when the case itself will be uh, heard or when it will be decided, um, nor when we'll hear from the same judge who only a few weeks ago presided over a trial involving several transgender adults and children suing the state of Florida for an earlier ban on Medicaid coverage for gender-affirming care. Um, With similar cases happening in other states as they pass laws, I I can imagine, I'm no legal expert, that it's only a matter of time before some of these cases get decided and probably move up into the appeals court, or maybe even eventually the Supreme Court has to weigh in. Uh, Meanwhile, the human rights campaign this week declared a national state of emergency for LGBTQ plus people for the first time. According to the HRC, these bills are just some of more than 500 that they describe as attacking the LGBTQ community and have been introduced in state legislatures in the current session alone. And almost half of those specifically target the transgender community. With more than 70 of those bills becoming law, as I said, we'll start to hear more of this from the courts pretty soon. Um, While some of these laws explicitly talk about health care, others don't. But it's a reminder that even laws that don't always seem directly related to health care, such as those, for example, about marriage, can impact one's health. Um, And also that the LGBTQ community needs to be a focus of health equity efforts. Um, Kathleen, I know you've edited a few health affairs papers on those topics recently. So what what did you find out? First of all, There is a lot of heterogeneity in the community. And so, but still, most sexual minorities are at risk, increased risk of preventable chronic illness, mental illness, and substance use, and injury and mortality. And of course, the risk is higher for people of color. And just this month, we looked at how health insurance coverage has improved for the LGBT community, adults specifically who had lower coverage in 2013 before the Obergefell Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage and uh, before the ACA. And then after these two uh, policies took effect, the LGBTQ community adults had higher rates of coverage. And so I think that's a piece of good news, along with some of the judicial, perhaps, protections that you talked about, Michael. Um, But, you know, there's also the the situation with disabilities. Um, The LGBTQ community has disabilities at twice the rate of other adults. And uh, we published a paper on that uh, last October in our disability issue. 
So I think this research that we're talking about is very hard earned because good data on sexual minorities is very scarce. So I understand, though, that there are some promising developments in this area. Michael, I think you've taken a look at that. Right. Um, yeah, it's definitely the case that, you know, we we don't get probably as much research in this area because we just don't have the data to look at it. Um, and we know without that data, it's hard to know exactly what the challenges are and then also hard to know whether solutions are working or not. Um, for the most part, uh, I think it's pretty clear that healthcare data in this country hasn't systematically collected information on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, you know, when I fill out forms for the doctor's office, it's only recently that sometimes there's another option besides male or female, but even those are usually pretty limited. We actually ran a Health Affairs Forefront article just uh, a week or two ago by ICF's John Auerbach and the University of Miami's Claude Fox, where they um, they said, we don't know much, for example, about mortality rates for the LGBTQ population because death certificates don't capture sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and even in situations where the data is collected, um, it's often in small samples um, that don't allow for the kind of extensive analysis we're getting used to in, in healthcare and health policy research. Um, but they also, in their article, pointed out that the White House recently issued a report on gathering more evidence related to uh, LGBT equity issues, um, and of course, recommended collecting that information more often. Um, additionally, agencies such as the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, the CDC, and others at the federal level have issued some guidance for what questions to ask um, and, and how to ask them so that we can maybe collect this information in a systematic way, allowing for that larger research. Um, interestingly, they also point out that because of the continued fears of discrimination and stigma that, uh, you know, providers and other researchers have to be careful when they're collecting this data, that it's not perceived as harassment or further worsening the stigma or fear of even seeking health care um, that sometimes impacts these communities. Um, in other words, we really don't want to start asking the questions in a way that only worsens the problem and continues the legacy of uh, healthcare providers not always showing empathy or understanding to members of the community. So you mentioned your experience with providers and filling out um, forms um, and the, uh, the the two choices that exist often for gender. Um, providers have um, have um, come a long way, and, but it's only been recently they've started to understand some of the healthcare needs of the LGBT community can be very different. Uh, from the needs of non-sexual minorities. Uh, I personally have some experience with this um, as the parent of a transgender child. A uh, few, I remember 10 years ago, what it was like uh, going to the pediatrician and I'd have to strategize how to corral the doctor, the nurse, the secretary or the person who drew the blood, each of them to say, you know, explain how my child has a boy's name, but is really a girl, as you can see. They just were confused. But I saw recently how this is changing and how much easier it's become. It's as if the pediatrician's office has undergone some educational training from the, the, uh, the secretary on through the physician. And, um, I think that that's important to uh, take note of. The community of providers that provides specifically gender-affirming care has been well-developed. And for decades, um, they've had uh, evidence-based medical guidelines. Uh, these have been developed by organizations like the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the American Society of Endocrinologists, and uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has uh, come, come along uh, with these guidelines as well, and many other organizations, um, including the AMA and the ACP. The new state laws have interrupted access to care for many transgender patients, depending on what state they live in. So if you can imagine the anguish this creates for parents, their teens, and in some cases, some states, even adults who are personally personally affected. Yeah, Kathleen, hearing you talk about your experience, um, it's, it's interesting. There is certainly a lot more guidance out there, um, even at the federal level. If you look at the websites of the CDC, 
or um, SAMHSA and, and others, there's a lot of pages of, of information um, for sexual minority populations, but also for healthcare providers themselves. There's training curricula, for example, on SAMHSA's page on behavioral health equity, um, specifically for clinicians and the needs of the LGBTQ um, community. Um, it is interesting, though, to note that the guidance coming from the federal level and from state agencies can really can really flip. You can imagine, um, you know, some of these governors who have been involved in some of the laws we were talking about earlier are running for president, um, and the day after inauguration, some of these trainings and websites may be ceasing to exist anymore. And it's a real reminder, um, sort of the intersection of of politics and health. Not that we always need a reminder, but how it can really impact some people um, on a a daily level and whether they're getting um, care or what type of care they're getting. Um, I also, you know, as a paramedic, I, I saw some of these efforts to educate clinicians myself. Um, I, um, I can think back uh, 10, 20 years ago um, when I was a full-time clinician, and I'm sure I didn't know the words to use or the questions to ask members of the LGBTQ community. Um, but since then, I know I've been to national conferences and groups like even the National Association of EMS Physicians uh, fairly consistently have education on these topics at their national conferences. Um, I remember really well listening to a talk given by an emergency physician with a transgender child and the impact that had on me and other people in the audience. And I think as you said, we're definitely seeing a lot more from these national organizations. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I think these organizations are really the closest to the providers, and they have a lot of sway with helping providers uh, understand uh, how they need to um, make changes to provide care in the general practice setting for um, uh, sexual minority populations. I, I want to just share another example of um, how things have changed. Um, just uh, three years ago, I think, you know, having looked at the SAMHSA website, there were only one or two residential treatment programs for mental health care across the country that would accommodate transgender youth. Anyone who uh, was not binary still had to room with a binary child. And you can imagine a teen who already is um, steeped in mental health problems, what that could do to them. And that that's not going to be a comforting place, even if the institution really wants to try to provide the care. There are more of these RTCs now who provide this kind of care, uh, mental health care, and, um, and in fact, rely on evidence-based treatment. But again, some of these have been stopped in their tracks by some of the state laws. It's really interesting. The um some of these state laws are specifically carving out that if people have already started treatment, they can continue it while some of them are not. Right. And some of them, it's a little confusing where physicians don't know if they can continue treatment or not. And I think that'll be um, an interesting aspect of this too, as to whether treatment has to be stopped that's already started and the impact that can have. Absolutely. So Michael, we've had a good conversation. I think we'll have to leave it there for today. A reminder to all our listeners to take a look at health affairs coverage of health equity for the LGBTQ community and for all minority communities. Check out a current issue for the article on how Obergefell and the ACA impacted access to health coverage. Also, please leave us a review if you like the show and please tell a friend and subscribe to Health Affairs This Week wherever you get your podcasts. Michael, thank you. Thanks, Kathleen.